Okay, for this video, I wanted to go over how to properly record the sale of PTPs or publicly traded partnerships on your form 1040. So there's a lot of information to cover here. I've got some slides, a workbook, uh, some PDFs. And so let me run through what we have in front of us and then we'll get into the rules around the sale of PTP investments, why it's important to record the adjustments and everything else that goes along with this. So uh, I've got two slides uh, covering some background information, the fact pattern that we'll have. Uh, and then next I have the PDFs here. So uh, let me start with the 1099. So we've got a sample 1099 here for a taxpayer which shows during the year the sale of those PTP units, right? So we have publicly traded partnership here. It's separated into short term and long term, right? So uh, our taxpayer acquired these units uh, in pieces over the course of a number of years. So we have some sales here reported as short term capital gains basis not reported to the IRS. And then on the second page here, we've got uh, the last sheet or the sale of those long-term units. So uh, the long-term dispositions on these uh, PTP units is uh, the summary totals are down here, okay? Now, in addition to the brokerage statement, we have, of course, the K-1, right? So when you're an investor in a PTP, you should get a K-1 every year. Uh, so this is the K-1 for John Q. Taxpayer's final year. Uh, as a unit holder, right? So it is marked final up here. We do have some income and expense items. We'll go into all these details later. And then I have two sample 1040s. So why do we have two? What I wanna show is how the uh, sale of the units is recorded and it's done incorrectly, right? So I wanna show you what is done uh, quite, quite often and why it's wrong. And then we have an adjusted 1040 here with the actual numbers, the way they should be reported. And so you'll be able to see the difference between the two. The last item we have is a workbook. So I've prepared an Excel worksheet here that kind of lays out all the numbers that are reported that are on the 1099 and what kind of adjustments we need to make. And then the variance between the two. So I wanna pause for a second on the variances here because I think this is a really important just to get a sense of how important this is. Uh, so in this column down here, if we ignore the top section, what I've done here in these sections is summarize uh, what the numbers are on each schedule when they're done incorrectly and then what the adjusted actual numbers should be. So this incorrect column is what I see happen most often where somebody is a unit holder and they sell their investment and they just enter the brokerage amounts and then they enter the K1 amounts on page one, but they don't make the appropriate adjustments. So we can see we have uh, Schedule D, long-term and short-term capital losses, some amounts here on Schedule E for the ordinary income amounts, and then Form 4797, the sale of trader business assets. So this is what it looks like it's, if it was gonna be done incorrectly in total. In total, we were reporting effectively a net loss of $20,000 plus in various income items. This is the adjusted column, and this is what I'm gonna show you how to arrive at the correct amounts. We can see here already uh, quite some significant differences, right? When we adjust uh, the capital gain loss amounts on Schedule D, we have a, a net a gain of $2,700. So the total variance there, the swing is $12,894, already a big amount. We're not gonna see any changes with Schedule E, and I'll explain why that, that generally is the case. But then we see a massive difference with Form 4797. Right, you can see here, once we make all these adjustments, we have to have an inclusion uh, of a ordinary uh, gain uh, on the sale of assets for $62,870. And so when we look at the total variances, we have a, a net change of $75,000. So it's huge, a huge difference on a taxpayer's return when it comes to, uh, you know, how do you record these investments and the sale of these investments on the return? Are you doing it correctly or are you doing it incorrectly? Okay, so that covers all the worksheets that we have. Let's go back to the slides. I want to talk about PTPs a little bit, and then we'll talk about why the, why these adjustments are important, uh, and then the fact pattern. So, uh, high level here at the top, 
you know, PTBs, again, they're, they're, it's equity in a company. It's publicly traded on uh, a stock exchange in the U.S., right? So NASDAQ or NYSC. Uh, but the difference is the PTPs are still, uh, they retain their pass-through treatment as partnerships for federal tax purposes. Now, most uh, publicly traded companies are taxed as C-Corps, right? So the company itself is filing a tax return, it's paying taxes at the entity level, and that's it. And then, you know, to the extent there are distributions to owners, then they might have some income inclusion. But with PTPs, the entity is filing a return, but there is no tax paid directly at the company level, right? All the income and expense is allocated to the partners and reported on a Schedule K-1, and every partner has to accurately report the information to pay tax at their level. And that's where PTP compliance can get so complex is because every partner is different, right? They all have different tax rates. And uh, because it's flow through, very often this is either just flat out missed completely or it's just done incorrectly. So what are some of the big ticket items that result in some huge variances? The the big one, and, and then we're, we're going to focus on this certainly is uh, section 751, right? So when you sell a partnership investment, uh, generally that's just capital gain, capital gain or loss. But to the extent the partnership has underlying assets that are these quote hot assets, right? So those are inventory, unrealized receivables. When a partner sells their partnership interests, it is a deemed sale of their allocation of those assets. And those assets result in ordinary gain or loss. And so this is why uh, it, it is something that is missed so frequently is it's just flat out not recorded on the return. And so taxpayers are, are certainly underreporting their total taxable income and their tax liability. Now, the other big thing with PTP units is they are a per se passive activity, right? So any losses are just being suspended and rolled forward as passive activity losses under the PAL limitations. Uh, but when you sell your partnership units and you have a complete disposition, those suspended losses are freed up and uh, they're essentially recharacterized as non-passive and so now you can deduct all them in that year of sale. Now, the broker here is not reporting any of this information, right? So we'll look at the K-1 and see where this information is coming from. But the broker really only tracks, you know, how many units did you buy? What was the purchase date, the proceeds? When did you sell? And what do they think your cost basis is in the units? And what we'll see is that the cost basis is completely different than what it actually is. And so that's why it's so important to be making these appropriate adjustments on your tax return. All right, so let's look at the next slide here. We'll cover the fact pattern and then we'll start looking at uh, the numbers in detail. So the fact pattern we're gonna be working with here, we have John Q. Taxpayer. He bought these units over the course of several years and he sold everything in 2021. So over a several year period, he just bought units here and there and kept adding to his position. And then he ultimately just said, I'm, I'm out and just sold everything at once on one day done. Now he has been treating it as a passive activity investment. So all of these losses that have been carried forward have not been utilized in prior years, right? He is uh, appropriately deferring them or suspending them to future years until he has other passive activity income uh, to offset them or he sells the investment, right? Now he gets his K-1 that's marked final, right? Uh, and then he also gets his 1099 from his broker, which shows the long-term and short-term sales on these assets, but it also show, uh, obviously shows all the other stocks he was trading during the year, right? He is gonna be selling other stocks and bonds and things like that. Uh, but what I've done is I've condensed it to just, we're just focusing on this piece, right? Uh, how do we adjust for the sale of the PTP units? Um, and you know, not ignoring everything else, but we're just focusing on this and we're trying to eliminate the noise for now, just for purposes of this uh, tutorial. Now, once everything is said and done, the end result here is John is gonna have um, a, a separate allocations of capital gain or loss, short-term or long-term, and ordinary. 
All right, and, and that's something that's not reflected by the broker on the 1099s, and so that's why it's very important to really look closely at the K1s and make sure we're making all these adjustments, all right? Okay, so now let's start working uh, with the K1 itself. Uh, let's jump over to uh, the partnership K1. I wanna run through some of these numbers, uh, talk a little bit about each, and then we'll look at the uh, adjusted uh, sales schedule that's included with the K1 package. So a, th a couple things to highlight because this is a final year, right? So this is a, a partnership K-1 allocated to a John Q taxpayer down here. It's a publicly traded partnership. And what is important to note here is it is marked final. So we have a final K-1. And if we look at this uh, part, uh, item L for the capital account reconciliation, we can see that John had a beginning uh, partner co uh, capital account balance, right? Because he has owned this at the start of the year. He had some new contributions and allocation of income. And then the, withdraw the withdrawal distributions amount zeroes out his capital account. So he has a zero capital account right here. And the ending amount of liabilities allocated to him uh, is also zero, right? So between th these two pieces and the fact that it's marked a final, you know, we can be confident that uh, this was a final disposition of all of his partnership units. And that's important because, you know, not only are we recording sales of the units, but uh, to the extent that we want to free up those prior passive activity losses, we need a complete dis disposition of the asset, right? And so that, that is important here uh, for this fact pattern. Okay, so most of this income and expense item is, is consistent with what we see with PTP. So we have ordinary income or loss allocated uh, to John, 2200 bucks. Uh, we've got the line 10 item there, net section 1231 gain or losses, 131 in losses. Those are assets that are sold by the partnership, so actually sold. Um, and they were assets used in the trader business, held for longer than one year. So we get that preferable uh, 1231 loss treatment. On line 19A, we have the amount of distributions to John. So these, this is the actual amount of cash that was distributed by the partnership to John. This is not the amount of sales proceeds from the sale of the units, right? That is a separate uh, number, a separate issue that, that the broker is tracking, but this is the actual amount of distributions paid to John as an LP unit holder during the year. And then we have some uh, line 18C, non-deductible expenses, some AMT adjustments up here. N nothing too, um, you know, nothing too out of the ordinary or strange. What's the most important element um, of this K-1, given the year's sale, is the supplementary schedule. So within the K-1 package, there should be a schedule that looks very similar to this. So what this schedule is designed to do is let the LP unit holder know based on the amount of units they purchase over the years, their allocation of income and expense, and ultimately their, the sale of the units, how much of the capital gain should be recharacterized as ordinary, okay? So what I wanna do is, is walk through the columns, talk a little bit about each, and then we'll start looking at the Excel workbook and see how some of these items should be adjusted. Each worksheet from your PTP or MLP should look pretty similar, right? So it has these columns and then they also try to provide some details up here as to what each column is. So they explain the adjustment or the original item. And then, you know, with further instruction on where to report each piece on what form on your tax return, right? So if we start with column one here, units sold pretty straightforward, right? What they do, is they could try to consolidate a lot of the numbers. So if we go back to units sold here on the 1099 from the broker, you can see how they break out the sales in a lot of different pieces. So there's a couple of short-term sales according to the broker here. There's, there's the units there. And then they have a, a list of all the other units on the long-term side. Uh, on the PTP K1s in these schedules, you know, they try to just aggregate it by day, right? So if your broker puts in an order and it's split up into mo multiple orders throughout the day, uh, the PTP schedule here will just consolidate it. But that's what they mean by units sold is generally like how many shares of stock or shares of units are you selling? The sale date 
sale proceeds. The reason why they often leave this blank is uh, because they just want you to use what the broker has, right? So sales proceeds are the actual cash that you receive once you sold the PTP units through your broker. So column three sales proceeds should match exactly with what you have on your brokerage statement, right? So here we have the short term amount, the subtotal uh, for sales proceeds, $5,735. And then on the long-term side, we've got 67,291. Now, I know that total doesn't add up, right? So this is uh, one page of many a pages. And so I've just cut out the other extra pages, but on the long-term uh, side, uh, this PTP did sell $67,291 of gross proceeds on the dispositions. And all that was on uh, September 8, 2021. Okay, now column four, purchase price and initial basis amount. This amount should reconcile with what you have in your brokerage statement as well. What this represents is the actual amount of cash that you use to purchase the PTP units over the course of its life. So what the, uh, the partnership has here is $83,152. If we go back to the brokerage statement, we can see here that this cost basis on the long uh, on the short term side, according to them, is seventy two seventeen. And if if we if I pull up the calculator here and just do the math for us, so we can see how this works, seventy two seventeen forty. That's the amount of the um, uh, short term cost basis per the broker. If we add that to seventy five nine thirty four point six we got our total cost basis of 83,152. All right, so the cost basis per the broker should match the cost basis per the K1 uh, supplementary statement, the initial column four purchase price, okay? Now, what the this schedule is designed to do is show us that this might've been what you initially paid for it, but because this is a partnership, and you are allocated expenses, losses, you receive distributions, which are a reduction in, in, to your capital account. The amount of basis that you think you have in the broker is not correct, right? So this is the amount of basis that the broker has that was your initial basis, which is fine, but that is not the correct cost basis or adjusted cost basis in your PTP units. That's where number five comes in. So column five, is the cumulative adjustment to your basis in those PTP units. This number represents a couple things. One, it represents all the cash distributions made to you during the year, right? So if we go up to line, um, so 19A, the distributions, right? These cash distributions coming out from the LP to you during the year, that's a reduction to your cost basis. Allocations of losses or other expenses are also reductions to your cost basis. And so what the LP has done for us here is they have tracked the allocation of cumulative adjustments to basis for us during the lifetime of the investment. And so what they're arriving at here is they're telling us that in column six, this is our actual adjusted cost basis, our outside adjusted cost basis in the units um, on the date of sale. So when we look at the brokerage statement and we see that our cost basis is 83,152, the K1 per the PTP is telling us, no, it's actually 7,388. And so this is where we get the form 8949 column E adjustment. So if I go to the tax return really quickly here and, and just pull up the 8948 so we can get some reference points. 8948, sales or dispositions of the units. Column E is the cost basis. And so this is the cost basis per the brokerage statement, but what the K1 is telling us is this is not right, right? The adjusted cost basis is a different number. And so that is what we are changing here. So what the K1 schedule down here wants us to do is in the form 8949, our total cost basis for the sale of these PTP units should amount to 7,388, okay? Now, what's column seven? 
Column seven is the ordinary income carve out. So column seven is though that portion of the gain. So if we look at, uh, let me go to the worksheet here. I think this will uh, help kind of clarify what's going on. So uh, the original form 8949 entry. So this section up here is if we didn't make any of these adjustments, if we just entered the information on the brokerage statement. We've got our proceeds there, short term, long term, the cost. Um, code M just means we're reporting multiple uh, multiple sales on one line item and there's our net gain or loss, right? Um, now, what we're doing with the adjustments, the ordinary income adjustments, is we're saying, okay, we've got adjusted cost basis here. Remember, there's that 73088 number per the K1 worksheet, but not all of this gain, so not all of this, so if we didn't have any adjustments, right, so we just had this proceeds minus the adjusted costs, 65,640 in gain. What the K-1 schedule is telling us is that this is not capital gain, not all of it at least. Within this amount of adjusted gain, we have a carve out for what is ordinary income, and then the remaining amount is going to be capital gain. That's, that's what they're getting at here. And this number represents the sale of those, uh, that ordinary income recapture, the 751 assets, the hot assets. That's why this is such a significant uh, thing to remember to do on the tax return because this number doesn't show it up anywhere here, right? I mean, nowhere here does it tell us to enter something off a of K-1 that is gonna be ordinary income. Uh, or loss for that matter. It's our responsibility to pull these numbers out of the schedule to get the appropriate amounts recorded on the tax return. And so the ordinary income recapture piece, which is gonna be ordinary income tax or ordinary income tax rates, is reported on the form 4797. So form 4797 part two, line 10. If I go quickly to the uh, 1040, we look at that 4797 here so we can see where we're eventually pushing that amount to. So 4797, sale of business property. There's part two, line 10, ordinary gains and losses. And we have our sale of PTP units and it's going to be that $62,870 figure. Okay. Now, uh, if we go back to the K1, and I promise I'll go back all over, uh, over all this, you know, high level and in more detail. I just want to get through all the columns first. Uh, so uh, column eight is the AMT adjustment. So uh, when you have the sale of business assets, um, you very likely have differences in, in regular versus AMT computations. And so when we complete 6251, we're going to have an AMT adjustment for the $249, right? Uh, no big deal there. Column nine, this is really, really important too. So what they do in column nine is they try to tell us based on the information they have, what portion of these amounts are gonna be long-term versus short-term. So on this second line item here with $18, you can see 0% long-term. So we know all of that is short-term, uh, but again, there's uh, purchase price is 18, cost is 18, it's net zero, there's no other adjustment. So it's kind of a moot uh, line item. Uh, but the top one here is certainly important, right? We have a lot of numbers going on up here and what they're letting us know is that 92% of these allocable pieces are uh, affiliated with the long-term dispositions versus, uh, and the remaining 8% is short-term, all right? And so I'll show you why that's important and how we uh, adjust the computations on the Excel workbook uh, for that 92% piece. Now, columns 10 and 11, not covering it in this video because uh, these are depreciation adjustments, bonus depreciation, if you live in a state where you're paying state income taxes. Uh, in, our, in our example, John is a resident of Florida, so he doesn't pay state income taxes. Uh, but if you live in a state that has differences between what kind of depreciation is permitted for bonus, uh, depreciation or section 179, there are variances. So what they've done here is they've provided us um, different amounts or, or they, they, they've separated out the amounts that are attributed to bonus appreciation so we can make the appropriate adjustments if we lived in a state that had these kind of uh, differences. 
again, in our case, mood issue, right? We live in Florida, we're not paying state income taxes, so we don't have any of these kind of adjustments, all right? Now, what I wanna do next is, is dive into the Excel workbook in a little more detail. Because uh, I feel like, you know, kind of going through it pretty quickly, but, um, you know, I think we'll just spend some more time on these differences here and I think it'll be more clear. Um, okay, so again, the top portion here, these are the original values as reported on the 1099, but they are not correct, right? The correct amounts are reported down here after we make the adjustments using the information reported on the 1099 together with the information reported here on this Schedule K-1, okay? So, if we look at these columns, so the things that don't change here are the proceeds, right? So proceeds are proceeds, right? The, the amount of cash that you actually receive shouldn't change, right? The broker will have that information and what they have is, is good to go. So that's why we see the same uh, totals and we see the same allocation for long-term and short-term. Where we see the differences here are the cost basis, right? And then the adjustment. So obviously huge swings in cost basis, right? So 83,152 in total per the broker. And then the adjusted portion per the K-1 statement is only $7,388, right? So we've got a massive, you know, 75,000 plus uh, gap there. So how do we arrive with these numbers here? Well, we know the total is 7,388 7, per this worksheet, right? So there's the total that they want us to report on form 89, 49, column E. But how do we break out the short term and long term? Well, this goes back to the line nine, or sorry, column nine, percentage long term. So what they're letting us know here is that 92% of the 7,370 is long-term cost basis, the difference is short-term. And then because on this second line, we see 0% long-term, we know this is all short-term. So on the workbook here, what we've done is this amount, 6,780, that portion is 92% of the uh, 7,370. So if we did, let me get the calculator out again here, just so we can see how these numbers are working. Um, so if I did uh, 7,370, right, times 92%, I have $6,780. And so that's how we're getting that number there for long term, 6,780. And then I know that the, the plug figure, the difference has to be 608 in cost basis for the short term sales, right? Now, now that I've got these numbers all cleaned up, proceeds, costs that are, these are all going on the 8949, what do I do with the adjustments, right? So what I know is the overall adjustment to ordinary is 62,870, right? So that's the figure here, right? Um, the gain subject to recapture is ordinary income, $62,870. Now again, the split is 92% long-term and then the difference is gonna be short-term. So made a similar adjustment, right? So this amount, 57,840 is 92% of the total. And then the difference, the plug figure there for the short-term piece is $5,080. So when I net all these across, I've got the proceeds, costs, the codes here, the adjustments, the net capital gain or loss for short term is $98. The net capital gain uh, or loss on the long term side is a gain of $2,672. So these are the adjusted balances versus what was reported up here per the broker. So, you know, immediately just looking at this, you can see we're already off to a wildly different start uh, than had we done nothing. And so this is, again, why it's so important that these adjustments have to be made because otherwise you're just not appropriately recording the amount of gain or loss. All right, so that's the capital uh, gain or loss adjustments. And if we look at um, the adjusted 1040 here, let me go to the 1040 Schedule D. So again, we can just uh, see how the adjusted numbers are. So there's our short-term uh, values. There's that net 98 short-term gain. 
There's the net 2,672 loss. We can see the gross proceeds, the cost basis, the adjustments. And so the, uh, those, those numbers are flowing from the 8949, right? So we want the sale of PTP units to re reflect the proceeds, cost basis, the, the adjustments, and the net gain or loss after the adjustments are all made per the PTP uh, K1 worksheet. Okay, so that's what we've done here. Now, what are the next changes to make? Well, the next changes that are being made here are the ordinary income piece, right? And then the AMT adjustment. So now we need to look at form 4797 and see how those elements need to be updated. If we go back to the K1 worksheet, they do tell us here, this is the gain subject to ordinary recapture. This amount should be reported form 4797, part two, line 10. And then the adjustment is 8949 column G. Well, we've already seen that, right? So we, we've seen the adjustment here. This is the adjustment in column G uh, to get to the correct capital gain or loss. So we've already covered that piece. But now how do we get this amount reported on the 4797? So the 4797, uh, the three elements, right? Three elements for the year. The, the first one that's the easy one is the current year piece, right? So the sale of assets used in a trader business that are held for more than a year generally qualify for 1231 treatment. And so when you have 1231 gain or loss, you'll see it reported down here on line 10. And this amount flows through to 4797 in part one. So if I go to the adjusted return here, I think this will make it clear if I start here. We have 4797 part one amounts coming from K1. Now you'll notice that amount 512 is different than what I just showed you, right? So the amount I just showed you is $131, but the total amount we have here is 512. Well, that's because of the carryover, right? So on the, on the workbook, what we've done here is we've shown Okay, we've got the current year 1231 losses coming from the K1, but we do have prior year suspended 1231 losses that we couldn't use until this year because we, uh, because we finally sold the investment. So by selling those um, PTP units in total, we have freed up these prior year suspended 1231 losses. So this is why the total uh, 512 uh, is what's reported in part one, all right? So those amounts don't don't change, right? We don't have to make any adjustments there. So we've got the carryover 381, we've got the 131 from the current year, those are fine. Here's the big, here's the big change, right? The big ticket item, the 62,870, all right? So where where is that falling on the return? So part one, we have the sale or exchange of those assets used um, that were held for longer than a year. But then in part two, you know, per, per the worksheet and what they want us to do, these are ordinary gains or losses that are not included above. And so one question I get is, well, why aren't they 1231 assets? Well, 1231 assets don't include the sale of inventory, right? They don't include the sale of inventory. They don't include those, the sale of receivables. Those are the hot assets that have to be treated as ordinary gains or losses. And so that's why we find them down here in part two. So we add an entry for sale of PTP units, various uh, September 8 disposition, and then the column on the gross sale price, we just put 62,870, right? Again, that, that reconciles with the worksheet. No cost basis, no depreciation allowed. So the net gain or loss is this $62,870 figure. Okay, so now our 4797 looks a lot better than it did before, right? Before, uh, when we look at the return, we had only the 512 flowing through, right? Because we had the current year, 1231, we had the uh, suspended losses that were being freed up, but we had nothing in part two for the ordinary gain. Now we have the appropriate amount of ordinary gain in part two. There's the $62,870 figure, okay? Now, if we go back to the worksheet here, a few other things I wanna highlight. So we can see, and we touched on this earlier, right? We had a net, 20,000 some odd loss, 20,347 when we add up all these amounts. 
The amount of gain that we have now recorded is 55,417. So a massive swing, massive, massive swing in total income or, or, or total additions to their taxable income. So the total variance is this 75,000, um, sorry, 75,764 number. If you're wondering if that can be reconciled anywhere, it, it can quite easily. So the 75,764 should be the difference between the cost basis per this 1099s and the adjusted cost basis per those per that worksheet. So if you take the 1099 basis, a cost basis that you have um, from your broker, subtract out the adjusted cost basis per the K1 worksheet, right? So this amount uh, down here, cost basis column six, that difference, that net amount, 75,764, that should reconcile with all the changes in these income amounts, okay? So that's kind of a good check figure uh, to make sure that you're that you're doing all this correctly. Okay, so now that all those are entered, let's go back to the returns and just look kind of high level as, as to how much change there's actually enacted here. So let me jump up uh, just to page one. So this is the unadjusted return. So this is if John just entered the information from his broker, entered the information from page one of that Schedule K-1, and then did no adjustments. We can see we've got his wages up here. He's got capital loss of 3,000 because of that capital loss limitation. He's got an other income uh, negative amount, 10,223. And so those numbers are coming from schedules one and two. So if we look at schedule one and two, we can see there's that 1231 loss, uh, net loss on the rental real, um, rental real estate, partnership, S-Corp amounts coming from Schedule E, right? So there's those amounts. And then the Schedule D, we can see we got net capital losses across the board, right? So a lot of losses everywhere, right? So this is this is why, again, there's a huge, huge difference between, um, you know, simply just entering it as is and then, again, making the appropriate adjustments. So if I go back to, let me go back to, okay, so this is now the adjusted one. Notice how much this changes. So we still have the same wages, obviously, but capital gain or loss, now we have a, a positive capital gain, right? We have $2,770. Other income or loss, we now have a positive amount, $52,647, versus on the wrong one, we had a minus 10223 So John's taxable income increased by doing this correctly from $161,777 up to 230k. Um, so you can see how I, I think the IRS enforcement in this space is going to pick up because th these are this is a huge tax uh, windfall that they're not collecting because uh, people are just not aware that these adjustments need to be made, right? So if we look at the adjusted Schedule One, we can see here we've got a large um, $62,000 gain flowing through from the 4797. The net rental real estate loss is, is the same, right? It's still that $9,700. So $9,711 loss there, $9,711 loss there. But again, line four, huge difference, huge, huge difference. Uh, and the same goes for Schedule D, right? So Schedule D, now we have some positive capital gains. Once we adjust the cost basis here, column E, and then the adjustments, we have a positive amount of capital gains, short term and long term. And so, you know, John's tax taxable income and tax profile has changed significantly uh, by making these appropriate adjustments. OK, so uh, that covers it for this tutorial. I, I hope that was helpful. I hope I didn't go too quickly through it all. Um, you know, what's important to remember, I, I think the first thing that's important to remember is when you get a K-1 from a partnership, do not just look at the first page and kind of discard the rest of it. Really, really important to review all of the supplemental information in here uh, because you're going to need it to, to accurately complete the return. Actually, one final thing I just remembered that should be done as well is the 751 statement. So uh, on the adjusted return, uh, when you do dispose of partners, whether it's PTP units or just a partnership interest and you have 751 assets, 
you're going to have to include an IRC 751 statement. So we've got our 751 statement up here for the sale of units. Um, and you know, most PTPs will provide this, well, they'll provide an example. Um, so you can use their example or, or use a different example if you want. Uh, but you should let the IRS know that you have sold these units and you need that ordinary uh, income recapture that's going on the 4797. Okay, so that covers it for this video. I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for sticking with me to the end here. Any questions, obviously feel free to leave me a comment below and I look forward to seeing you again on the next video. Thank you.